thanks very much, uh, Carol. Um, I feel like I've been running into you at meetings and yeah. conferences and workshops for years and years, so it's finally, uh, it's great to finally see you in your own turf, in your own territory. Um, as, so, so there's a handout, and I've given this paper, this paper several times before and discovered that it actually takes me about 55 minutes or maybe even slightly more to present the whole thing, but I won't try to do that because I want to leave as much room as possible for, for, uh, for questions and discussions. So I'm going to highlight some things more that are on your handout and um, um, pass it more quickly over other things. Uh, but as Charles said, there is, a there is now a published version of this paper. Um, it's very hard to get this book. I noticed it's only, it seems to only be available in the UK. It's very expensive. Uh, but I'm sure uh, it will become um, marketed in the United States. And in any case, uh, a preliminary version of the paper is available for free on my website. So you can also um, get the paper there. OK, so um, the, the discussion that I want to uh, embark on is structured around a distinction between three different conceptions of self-determination, which I'm going to call the, the statist, the democratic, and the nationalist conceptions. Each uh, gets invoked in international affairs, often as part of a, a principle that um, States and other international actors are said to have a weighty uh, reason to fail. Uh, the statist principle of self-determination equates self-determination with state autonomy. So, the, so the, the statist view um, uh, interprets self-determination as imposing a negative duty on other state inter international actors, a duty of non-interference or non-intervention. I'm not going to say too much about this conception here uh, today, uh, except just to mention two traditional justifications that are offered for self-determination in this statist sense. Um, one justification uh, that is often repeated is, roughly speaking, rule consequentialist in Form. So it says that a, a, a general norm of non-interference helps to secure peace and world order by excluding various pretexts uh, for intervention, um, thereby diminishing the likelihood of violent conflict and um, reducing the need for anticipatory Militarization. So that's one, I think, traditional justification for the status view of self-determination. Self-determination as non-interference. Um, another, justif uh, another justification, which I associate with a very famous and influential paper by Michael Walzer called The Moral Standing of, uh, of States, um, argues that it's better when the citizens of the state rule themselves. So on this view, um, it's better when the political community's own politics are <coughs> what determine the outcomes that occur for that community. And, and Walter points to several different ways in which it's better when the politics of the state determine what happens in that, um, that state. Uh, but this second justification, I think, is better understood as introducing um, the second of my three conceptions, the democratic conception. Um, so um, on the, on the um, democratic conception, um, self-determination consists in uh, the people having the opportunity to determine their own affairs. Self-determination, in this sense, um, is partly a matter of non-interference. After all, if outsiders are interfering in what we're trying to do, then we don't have the full opportunity to determine our own affairs. But, and this is the important point for the democratic view, um, self-determination also requires the, not just something negative, but it requires something positive. It requires the presence of institutions and structures through which the, the people can manage and determine their own affairs. So on the democratic view, there's both a negative uh, condition on interference and a positive condition in the presence of 
um, of uh, these, in these institutional structures through which um, self-government occurs. Um, paradigmatically, these institutional structures, I think of them as being democratic, uh, but the view, I think despite, its, despite the label I've given it, um, could in principle make room for a somewhat broader range of what you might think of as in inclusive institutional uh, um, possibilities, including what John Rawls called the law of people, uh, a um, decent consultation hierarchy. That would be perhaps another possible institutional structure through which self-determination could, could take place on this democratic view. Um, now, the negative, in some cases, the negative and positive conditions, which go into the democratic view, are going to pull in opposite directions. Um, at, in, such, in such a way that self-determination may not always require non-interference on the part of outside actors. You could imagine scenarios in which um, uh, outside actors uh, decide that it makes sense to engage in perhaps a limited form of interference or in intervention to help support or help create uh, the appropriate decision-making institutional structures through which the positive condition can, can be satisfied. But these, so there are two separate conditions and they're not always perfectly uh, aligned with one another. The third conception, the nationalist conception, uh, focuses on a condition that's highlighted by neither the statist nor the democratic view. It starts from the observation that the world is home to a number of different socio-cultural groups that can be thought of as nations or peoples. States might have historically been pivotal in creating and in maintaining these peoples, but still, there's a conceptual difference between a state and a people. A people, even though it may have been created by a state, uh, assumes a life of uh, of its own, which isn't, which is, which is not necessarily completely tied to the life of the state. So you can have, as a result, um, states that contain more than one nation, um, and you can also have nations that are spread across more than one. Um, more than one state. So the nationalist conception of self-determination uh, holds that it is peoples understood uh, in this sense of socio-cultural groups, understood as nations, that ought to be self-determining. So in other words, according to the nationalist view, self-determination has what you might think of as a, a boundary condition. Uh, a people is only self-determining if it's able to determine its own affairs uh, through its own structure. So this requires a congruence between, if you like, the political boundaries uh, on the one hand and the boundaries uh, of the nation or the people on the other hand, boundaries of the socio-cultural group. So those are the three conceptions. And really, my aim in the paper is to reflect on which of these conceptions of self-determination is most defensible and appropriate? Um, I'm, and I'm specifically thinking about um, international law and practice. That's kind of the context in which I, what, in which I wrote the paper. Uh, but I think it also has some broader relevance to um, individuals who live in multinational um, states. So it has relevance to their domestic politics as well. Most political theorists and philosophers gravitate, I think, towards the democratic conception. For reasons I won't go deeply into, the status conception doesn't have a lot of uh, proponents uh, today. The democratic conception, on the other hand, is um, not necessarily the consensus view, but I think it's a, the, probably the most widely endorsed view, at least uh, amongst um, Anglo-American political philosophers. Um, the democratic conception is um, thought of as being um, well aligned with um, crucial values of um, democracy, obviously, of inclusion, uh, and human rights. Uh, by contrast, uh, for many political theorists, um, 
it's it's harder to see what the uh, it's harder to make out the basic concepts uh, and the normative commitments that are associated with the nationalist view. No doubt, some of you already have questions in your mind about some of the terms that I've I, that I've introduced, like people and nation. So these things they seem harder to pin down and perhaps less morally urgent than the principles and concepts that are associated with the democratic view. Um, in the paper, however, I want to take the opposing view uh, and argue that self-determination in the nationalist sense um, is a legitimate expectation of a group and a legitimate international concern. I don't think that denial of self-determination in this nationalist sense represents a fundamental injustice. Uh, but I think it is reasonable for the international community to take proportionate measures to promote this idea. That's, that's the claim. So I wanted to take quite a long time just to set up the claim, because even if I don't get to fully give you the argument, that, that will at least give us something to uh, get the discussion going. Um, so let me say a little bit more, let me refine now the claim as I, as I understand it. Um, so it's often, I think it's often um, supposed, particularly by critics of the nationalist view, um, that, um, that the nationalist conception um, has extreme and unpalatable implications. Um, so one reason I think that people suppose this um, is that they look at the boundary condition that I mentioned, this idea of congruence between the political unit and the socio-cultural unit. Um, and they suppose that the boundary condition is meant to substitute for the political condition. So on this substitution view, it doesn't matter if um, the regime that we live in is democratic or not, so long as whatever non-democratic authoritarian regime is in place is in some sense associated with our national national group. So on that substitution view, what becomes important is just the nature of the group that's in power and not the, the way in which it rules or not the, the, not the nature of the institutions through which it governs. So that's, I think, one sense that's led people to dismiss, one idea that's led people to dismiss the um, the nationalist conception. Um, a second reason, I think, is a, ten is a tendency to assume that the congruence that I've talked about um, must take the form of the nation state. So on, on, on that view, each nation must possess its own state. Now, and many of you will have heard the famous phrase um, uttered by Woodrow Wilson, Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, um, who said in the aftermath of the Versailles negotiations, when they were trying to figure out what self-determination meant, said, well, self-determination, he thought you know, it was a very unfortunate phrase for the United States to become involved in. He said that self-determination is a phrase loaded with dynamite. Um, and the thought is that there's just too many nations in the world, and the, nation, and the states that there are are misaligned um, quite systematically with those nations. And so to announce this principle of national self-determination, and in particular to announce it in a way that raised the expectation that each nation could expect to have its own state, um, was to invite um, kind of chaos and if not massive, massive bloodshed. Okay, so the version of the nationalist conception with which I have some sympathy um, is a moderate one in, this, in the sense that it tries to avoid both of these extreme um, assumptions. So on the, uh, on the view that I argue for, um, the negative, the positive, and the boundary conditions must all be satisfied. So there's no possibility here. It's not a question of substituting the boundary condition for the positive condition, which requires the presence of democratic institutions. Instead, the point is about, well, what are, what, are, what are the boundaries, what are the scope of those democratic institutions going to be? So it's an additional supplementary condition rather than a, a condition that substitutes for the positive condition. So I don't think it's particularly friendly to authoritarian, uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, likewise, um, as I understand the boundary condition, this idea of congruence again, um, it doesn't require full 
uh, statehood, uh, it's enough for the political and cultural to be aligned um, that uh, minority um, national groups enjoy significant autonomy within a multinational, uh, <coughs> multinational state. So we're familiar with various institutional schemes through which that can take place, including federalism, uh, confederation, devolution, um, and other kind of hybrids of those, of those ideas. Um, so the view that I want to defend is moderate um, in the sense that um, it's, I think, con consistent with prioritizing democracy and in the sense that it um, um, doesn't require the each nation have its own state, but does insist on internal autonomy. Um, so to use the, the, the sort of the jargon that sometimes um, uh, employed in discussions of self-determination. Um, my concern is with internal boundaries, not external boundaries, and thus with internal self-determination and not with external self-determination. Ex external self-determination is, is usually secession, right? The creation of a new, a new state, a break, the breaking away from a multinational state. That's not the sort of emphasis of my uh, of, the, of my discussion today, it, it might be that secession is sometimes permissible, sometimes legitimate, it's part of a remedial view of secession, but that's that's not the claim that I'm trying to develop now. Okay, so um, the nationalist conception, uh, even in this moderate uh, form that I'm going to try to defend it in, faces uh, a series of, I think, very serious philosophical challenges. Um, I'm going to mention four in particular, and then the way the main argument of the paper works is by trying to respond to each of these four, uh, four challenges. Um, and, and the hope is that in the course of developing responses to the challenge, um, a um, uh, the sort of theoretical and normative basis of the moderate view should come into focus, and we'll have reasons for preferring the moderate nationalist conception over the um, democratic alternative. Or, 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 or I should say, over a view that stops at the democratic uh, conception. Um, so the four uh, philosophical challenges that I want to consider are first, uh, what I call the, the um, ontology, uh, problems. So, is it, it is the notion of a national group or a socio-cultural people a coherent one? Can we make can we make sense of that idea? Um, then the, the second problem is the problem of value. So, even if um, even if we can make sense of the idea of nations or peoples, um, are there reasons to think that it's valuable for nations or peoples to be self-determining? Um, the third um, problem is the problem of justice. So even if we meet the two above challenges, the ontology and, and value problems, uh, I think we're still left over with the question of um, do, even if it's valuable to be self-determining, it's not that it doesn't imply that people have a claim of justice to, to arrangements that allow for self-determination. So that seems like a distinct third hurdle that would, be, has, would, would have to be uh, um, crossed over in order to successfully make the case that I want to make. Um, and then finally, uh, and I, I have a feeling I won't really get to this, but I'd be happy to discuss it in, in the Q&A. Um, finally, there's um, a question about institutions. And the question I have in mind here is, would um, attempting to institutionalize as part of international law or international practice um, a norm of self-determination in the nationalist sense, would that produce perverse, would that have perverse consequences? Would it lead to objectionable, perhaps unintended, but objectionable um, consequences? So there's the problems of ontology, value, justice, and, um, and consequences. Okay, so let me start then, uh, spend some time on the problem of ontology, and I'll see, I'll see um, where that leads us. Um, so, at first glance, the problem of ontology might seem um, a, little, a little surprising. 
Um, after all, uh, we're all familiar with reading news reports uh, and perhaps reading in the political science and legal literatures about various national minorities, and they're often referred to as being na national groups and, uh, in a somewhat unproblematic sense. So we hear about the Quebecois and the Scots and the Catalans and the various Russian minorities that are left over in uh, the former Soviet Union, and the list goes on and on. In fact, it turns out that most countries in the world have national, a national minority or, or, or more than one national, uh, national minority. So the list, at least at first glance, doesn't strike people as being especially uh, controversial. Um, however, when uh, people first started struggling with the task of um, individuating national groups, again in the aftermath of the Versailles uh, settlement, um, it turned out to be more difficult than, uh, than they thought it would be. Uh, so they were competing criteria. Some people wanted to identify nations with language groups, some with ethnic groups. Some thought, no, we've just got to go by self-identification self and sort of have a plebiscitary conception of uh, groups. And uh, not surprisingly, these different criteria could pull in different directions and um, lead to different judgments. Um, so things are more complicated than they look. Also, if you think about it, there are some, there are some definitely some hard cases out there, right? That, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure whether I would consider um, uh, particular certain cases, how I, would, how I would come down in certain cases. So one place I actually gave this talk when I was first developing it uh, was in Hong Kong where there's a lot of interest in self-determination, and there's a kind of emerging sense of cultural difference from, uh, from um, mainland China. So should we think of the people of Hong Kong as being a distinct sociocultural group for the purposes of this kind of argument? It strikes me as an interesting and difficult, difficult case. Um, in recent years, the um, problem of what I'm calling the problem of ontology, of how we kind of identify groups and whether these groups are even coherent or not, um, the, the problem has become intertwined with worries about essentialism. So can, here I think the puzzle is, can, can we identify um, social groups um, in a manner that does justice to their inevitably heterogeneous character, their eternally diverse character, to uh, the fact that um, the main features of the group are often contested within, within the group, uh, to their dynamic character, the fact that groups are kind of changing and evolving, um, and to the fact that, uh, if you think of several groups, that they're kind of systematically interrelated, right? The development of the nature of one group is, is developed in part in response and in contact with other, other groups. So these are the sorts of issues that uh, people who worry about essentialism point to heterogeneity, um, dy dynamism, contestation, inter hy hybridity, and kind of inter interrelations between, between groups. So can we, think, can, can we develop, uh, if you like, a non-essentialist a non group, a uh, conception of groups? And can we do so? in a way that avoids reducing um, groups to mere patterns of discourse, kind of like 17th century witchcraft discourse. I mean, we could all admit that there was such a, a discourse, but we, we also think that there wasn't kind of a reality that sort of in any way corresponded to that, to that um, discourse. And it's certainly not something that would have normative, normative uh, resonance or give, give rise to claims or, or, or rights of any kind. So can we, can we kind of carve out a non-essentialist conception of groups that's nonetheless um, ha has normative salience? That's, that's, I think, the sort of the chief puzzle on the heading of, of ontology. Um, well, in other work, uh, I've, in, particularly in the book Equal Recognition that Carol mentioned, um, I've tried to develop a non-essentialist uh, non conception of culture. Um, and I, I draw in this paper on that, on that other work. 
Uh, and the, so the thought behind a non-essentialist conception of a cultural group is roughly, roughly this. Um, we don't want to identify groups in terms of particular traits like um, beliefs, values, uh, even, even practices that everybody participates in. Um, because if we take the essentialist cha challenge seriously, um, there is no single trait or belief or value that everybody uh, endorses. These things are, there's heterogeneity, there's change over time, there's, there's, con there's con contestation. Um, so instead, what I suggest is that we try to identify groups in terms of what I call their social lineage. So just the, the, there's the, sort of the, develop the idea by thinking through a kind of philosophical parallel with how biologists think of species. You don't you can't think of species by looking for particular traits that all the members of the species all share in common. Instead, biologists identify, Darwinian biologists identify species by looking at lineages and, and kind of population, population lines over, over time. So it's a sort of same thought, but applied to, um, sort of to a more sociological context. So the thought is that individuals belong to the same social or cultural group when they've been, when they've been formed by a common social environment, a common set of practices, institutions, and so forth. And as a result of being formed by a common social environment, um, they interact more intensively with one another than they do with individuals uh, who aren't formed by that common social, uh, social environment. So you have a minority group when you have a group of people who share with one another exposure to a formative context, a social environment, um, that isn't so um, significant in the lives of the majority, or the majority are instead subject to a different set of practices and institutions, a different, a different social environment. So this is a very broad conception and includes groups that I think are not, certainly includes groups that are not specifically national in character. Uh, a national group has three um, additional characteristics that I think are, that, that aren't entailed conceptually by the idea of a social lineage group, but which are, I think, empirically related to that idea. It's not surprising that some cultural groups in the sense that I've just described uh, become uh, national, national groups. So one characteristic is that the distinctive social environment that helps to individuate a group is what I call multi, it's multi-dimensional. Uh, by that I mean that um, there are a number of different institutions and practices that roughly coincide with one another and that distinguish the minority from the majority. So that if you like the distinctive um, treatment that's applied to people who are in the minority um, has many has many layers to it. It's not just there's not just one dimension of difference, but there are many that are kind of piled um, piled on top of one. So if you think of the paradigm case of a nation, um, a nation will often um, this is people who live in a territory that's isolated from the territory where, where others live uh, that speak. Uh, a language that's different from the language that others speak, that have their own institutions of government and administration, their own, their own school system perhaps, um, that perhaps have their own religion and their own religious, uh, religious institutions, and probably in virtue of all those other facts, they'll, they'll have their own, uh, to emphasize a point that, um, that Anderson emphasized and his idea of imagined communities, they'll have their own media and literature and. Um, in institutions relating to um, media that focus particularly on uh, on that group. So there'll be a whole series of of, of, of layers of or dimensions, let's say, of isolation of the group from um, others uh, from others uh, around them, um, and um, th this will um, kind of add up to 
a social experience that's very distinctive. So the multidimensionality is one characteristic. Um, the second characteristic um, is that this distinctive socialization leads to a distinctive pattern of beliefs and values, what you might think of as a state of culture. Again, it's not that everyone shares these beliefs and values, that would be the lapse back into um, essentialism, um, but that the frequency of particular beliefs and values is going to be much, much higher as a result of having this distinctive social experience as it would be for those who don't have the, the distinctive um, social experience. So that's the second, the second characteristic that makes the cultural or social group in general a national group. And then the third is um, identification with uh, the group and the, and, the, and the valuing of the group. So can it even be that everyone identifies with the national group or values the national group, but um, again, this is something that's kind of, um, uh, a, a, sort of a common attitude within, within the group. So people um, think of themselves as being members of the group. They value that membership. Um, they feel respected when the group is respected and disrespected when the group is disrespected. Um, and they desire for the group to be uh, self-governing to at least some, some degree. And I think this sense of identification, or if you like identity, um, it, it flows from the kind of social isolation that I've been talking about. So if you've um, undergone a distinctive social uh, formation, then it's, no, it's not surprising if you develop an attachment to others, a special attachment to others who have undergone a similar uh, socialization. Uh, it's also not surprising if you come to value the particular institutions through which that socialization and feel an feel a attachment to them. Uh, so the kind of causal arrow goes in that direction. The causal arrow actually also goes in the other direction. So that having the identity might lead you to put yourself in to particular contexts of socialization or contexts of uh, formation. So perhaps if you have a, a, I don't know, a strongly Canadian identity, then you might think, well, I'm going to take all my vacations in Canada. I'm going to read Canadian newspapers and watch Canadian TV and listen to Canadian bands. And, and so it's there. It's going from my, the identity is producing uh, a socialization that is to some extent distinctive and kind of isolated from the socialization of, in that case, um, Americans. OK, so to summarize, um, a national group, as I understand it, is a group of people who are formed by a distinctive, multidimensional social environment, who exhibit a distinct culture as a consequence, and many of whom have a national identity focused on the group in question. And I think that this account is able to pick out a lot of the commonly mentioned national groups, and it can also help us to sort of sort through the hard cases, like the case, the case of Hong Kong. Right? as an example, and it does so without um, at least an objectionable form of essentialism. Uh, so that, that's what I wanted to say about the, um, uh, about the ontology problem. Let me talk more briefly about the, about the value question. So what is the, um, why well, I think that it would be valuable for a distinct national group, in the sense that I've been describing, to be, um, to be self-determining. Um, and here I think my approach follows some of the standard approaches in the literature a little bit more uh, closely than I have so, so far. So if you think about um, accounts of self-determination offered by Raz and Margulit, for instance, or by David, uh, David Miller, they tend to emphasize both an instrumental benefit that flows from self-determination self and one that's more um, like intrinsic, not non instrumental. So, the instrumental benefit involves the idea that um, if you think of the national, the national group, a national minority, as being defined in part by common culture, by distinctive pattern of beliefs and values, um, if the national group enjoys some form of political autonomy, perhaps as part of a um, multinational, multinational state, 
then it'll, it'll be able to make political decisions that fit more closely with its um, values and traditions and, and, um, and, and beliefs than it would be, then would be the case if the national minority was part of a much larger decision-making uh, population, which they were only a tiny, tiny minority. In a, in a much larger decision-making case, it's likely that their distinctive views about value, their distinctive um, traditions, etc., would be um, uh, sort of drowned out by the views of views of the majority. So that's kind of the, in a nutshell, the instrumental view. It's, I think it's closely connected with what Walzer calls, he talks, he talks about fit, which is a term I just used, and he also talks about communal integrity, and that's, that, that's something that um, is produced by a group that's able to make public decisions that um, fit with, or correspond with, or are congruent with the existing values, traditions, beliefs, etc., of members of the, of the population. Um, okay, so that's one argument. And the other argument, which is more intrinsic in character, um, emphasizes both cultural. Well, there's two variants of it. One that emphasizes cultural preservation, and the other that simply says that part of being a national group is to desire that the group be uh, self-determining or self-governing. Um, and so, almost by definition, um, autonomy for such a group um, responds to that, responds to that design. Okay, so framing the, that, I think that last way of framing the answer to the question about value segues nicely to the uh, question about justice, the problem of justice. Since um, the, way I, the way I just described the value of self-determination was largely cashed out in terms of um, uh, helping people to satisfy their preferences, their desires, their, um, to realize the values that they, in fact, hold. Um, and, and you might ask, well, there's no requirement of justice that we that we help people to maximally satisfy their preferences or realize the values that they, that they hold. That just doesn't seem to be a matter of um, justice. So I think it is important to discuss justice as a kind of distinct um, step that's different from um, setting out the, the value of self-determination. That's one place in which I would distinguish my approach from the Raz and Margaret. I think they do a magnificent job of, of, of talking about the value of self-determination but they have very little to say about um, why we should think self-determination is something that we kind of owe to one another right, as a matter of, as a matter of justice. Um, so um, the, I think the first step in thinking about this question um, is to note that uh, self-determination is a good that can be distributed more or less equally. That's might be a little bit complexing, so let me try to explain that. Um, you know, one extreme um, would be uh, that some national group within society might, in, might enjoy no autonomy whatsoever, no self-determination whatsoever, um, as part of uh, the group with which they identify. Whereas um, some other group, perhaps the majority in society, um, may um, have at their disposal decision-making institutions that fit very closely with their conception of political, uh, political community. So I think a helpful example perhaps to think about is, uh, is Great Britain. Um, so imagine a Great Britain in which there was no devolution for Scotland. So this is Great Britain before what, 1997 or something. It was roughly 1997. Um, oh, what was it? Yeah, 1997. 1997. Okay. Um, so think of yeah, think of Great Britain prior to 1997. Um, for for people in Britain who had a Britain-wide 
uh, sense of national identity, for whom Britain was their polit the political community they identified with, um, the decision-making structures, the, the democratic institutions corresponded perfectly with that sense of national identity, whereas for those who lived in Scotland and had a Scottish national identity, there was no democratic forum that corresponded to that sense of uh, identity. So that to me is an example, that would be an example of an inequality in the distribution of self-determination. Those with the British identity have, have the whole pie, in a sense, and those who um, have the Scottish identity have that. Um, you could also, um, however, uh, imagine that uh, the distribution the distribution of self-determination would be uh, more egalitarian. And I think that in, this, in the British case, devolution introduced a kind of equality that had been absent prior to 1997. Uh, it's an equality that you could imagine, um, it, 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 you, could, you could almost imagine neighbors living in Scotland, um, one of whom identifies mostly with Britain and one of whom identifies mostly with Scotland. I think they can, after devolution, they can think of themselves as being equals in the sense that they can each, they each enjoy a political forum in which important decisions are made democratically uh, that uh, the boundaries of which correspond to their sense of political community or their sense of national, national identity. So that would be an example of a more egalitarian uh, arrangement as far as self-determination. It's a rough form of equality, but I think it's a form of equality um, none, uh, nonetheless. So um, I don't want to run out of time, but the, ba the, basic, uh, the basic claim is that um, uh, while justice doesn't require uh, that anybody's preferences be satisfied or that they get to realize the values that are important to them, uh, it does, um, there is plausibly a requirement of justice that, um, that institutions be, uh, that the institutions treat fairly the different uh, attachments um, and uh, preferences that different uh, individuals have. So I think that in the pre-1997 uh, pre Britain, to return to that example, those whose attachment was with Scotland, I think, could plausibly argue um, that um, their attachment was not fairly treated, it wasn't neutrally uh, treated by the arrangements of the British state, whereas perhaps after, after 1997, you could argue that um, there was a kind of equal treatment or fair treatment of these different conceptions insofar as each sense of national identity had a forum in which it could um, pursue its uh, in which it could kind of realize the sense of identity that it, that it, um, that it valued. Um, so that, that's kind of been a, um, in a nutshell what I wanted to say under the heading of uh, justice. I'm skating over some of the interesting complexities. Maybe I will wrap up, since I think I've been going about 40, 45 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so I will say something briefly about institutions because I think this is, a, this is a kind of interesting part of it. Um, so, the, so the final concern that I highlight is whether or not um, um, interpreting claims to self-determination that, that say that are found in contemporary inter international human rights covenants and, doc and other documents, uh, interpreting them in, in the uh, as referring to the nationalist conception and introducing this, if you like, into international law and practice, does this have um, objectionable consequences with it be destabilizing, for instance? Um, and to sort of make sense of this, um, think about sort of two main kinds of consequences that are highlighted by critics of um, national self-determination. Um, one uh, highlights the way in which a right of self-determination can um, stimulate interstate conflict. And it starts from the observation that many, uh, many national minorities that are 
um, seeking greater, greater autonomy, um, do so in a context of um, what you might call irredentist conflict. Right? So they're a national minority, in part because they're on the wrong side of some international boundary, and there's a homeland state on the other, on the other side. And what they actually would really like, or at least what some of them would really like, would be to be reunited with the homeland, uh, the homeland state. Think of all the, you know, the Hungarian minorities that are in various countries in, in um, Central and Eastern, Eastern Europe. Um, these are these are um, kind of irredentist minorities, and so the the, the worry is that by um, by um, Supporting a nationalist conception would kind of support their claims. Um, it would um, reinforce interstate uh, conf the interstate conflict, which arises from these irredentist. So that's one one worry. And then the other worry, which is in some ways more a more familiar um, worry for someone like me from Canada, or some thinking in terms of the examples of Spain and uh, Britain, would be that. Um, uh, some worry that uh, autonomy within a multinational state will be used by advocates of secession as a platform uh, from which to make further demands for secession. So this was one of the main reasons why people resisted devolution prior to 1997 was that they predicted that Scottish nationalists would use the creation of a Scottish parliament as a platform to demand um, more and more and more. Okay, so these are these are objectionable consequences that might arise um, uh, from accepting the proposal that I've, I've been discussing. Um, so I don't think one can. I don't think any regime completely avoids um, the possibility of adverse um, consequences, um, but there are ways I think of reducing the risk. Um, so one theme that I emphasized in the paper, but I, but I didn't have a chance to talk about it so much um, today, is um, the theme of um, pro proportionality. So I think that claims to self-determination, while they are appropriately regarded as matters of international concern, are not in general, unless they're connected with other wrongs and other rights abuses, but they're not on their own matters of fundamental uh, fundamental justice, right? And so as a result, um, expressions of international concern that are proportionate um, to the, the wrong of, of denying uh, self-determination um, are going to have to accept very serious uh, constraints and serious limits. So a lot of the things that I think have historically been destabilizing, such as um, issuing ultimatums, as the Nazis did uh, with respect to um, German minorities in the 30s, um, arming guerrillas in other countries, um, uh, refusing to recognize uh, some entity as a state. And these are all very serious actions which have very far-reaching consequences for the capacity of states to kind of do their, perform their basic functions. I, I think they would all be disproportionate to the um, to the concern with self-determination. So I think, we, in part, we need to take the, the theme, of the, the idea of proportionality very, uh, very seriously here. And then I guess I'll just put one other idea on the table before I, um, before I stop, and that is, I think there are also, and this, and this is thinking about the, the second of the mechanisms that produces instability, the idea of Autonom of, of internal autonomy as being a stepping stone or a platform to full, full secession. Um, I think that there ought to be an idea of, um, of reciprocity that accompanies our thinking in this, in this area. And by that, that I mean that if a multinational state does a good job of um, carving out a space for internal autonomy, for a national minority, then um, then the international community, be it sort of the UN or the EU or whatever the relevant um, uh, actors might be, 
um, ought to um, uh, recognize that internal autonomy arrangement um, by extending a guarantee of territorial integrity to the multinational, multinational state. So the Scots or the Catalans, to give those examples, would be, if, if this is controversial, but if one thought that they were adequately uh, recognized within multinational uh, states, then um, uh, it, I think it would be reasonable for the EU to say, well, if Scotland were to secede or if Catal Catalonia were to secede, um, it's far from automatic that those new entities would be uh, become members of uh, the EU. That's, I think that's a way of kind of rewarding states for implementing schemes of um, internal autonomy without producing this um, kind of danger of um, danger of instability. Okay, so uh, the idea that I've talked about today was, I think, briefly in vogue in the early 1990s when the world, and in particular Europe, was trying to figure out how to deal with all these new entities that had been created with, by the collapse of uh, communism and the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, some of the, I think, great statements in law and political theory about self-determination were not surprisingly written in that uh, time. Um, sadly, not much has actually happened at the political or legal level since then, and it's kind of fallen off, uh, fallen off the agenda, and we remain very much with a statist or perhaps a quasi-democratic conception of, um, of self-determination. I think the main reason why the, national, the nationalist conception of self-determination has not uh, gotten hold is political states don't want to have other states in, with new reasons to meddle in their uh, affairs and exercise um, monitoring and so forth. But there are also intellectual obstacles, I think, to the nationalist conception of self-determination. Many liberal-minded people just don't think that there's uh, a, a good principled reason why we uh, ought to think about self-determination self that way or why we ought to um, think that it's important that national groups enjoy self-determination. And what I've tried to do in this paper is to address those intellectual obstacles and argue that um, there are reasons to think that they're, um, they're, 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 they're not as substantial as they are. I'll stop there and I'll look forward to your questions. essentialist proposal, as you, as you call it, yeah. um, on the handout. And uh, I'm sympathetic with this idea, uh, but I wonder about your formulation, so I want to ask you the following way. I'm just going to look at this. No, I did hear your presentation. I'm going to look at the statement on the handout and use that as a, a kind of tool to ask the question. So the way it's stated here, it seems rather tautological to me. It seems so, rather tautological. Tautological. Okay. So, just quoting your handout, individuals belong to a common socio-cultural group and formed by a common social environment. So, you have a social group when it has a common social environment. Yeah. Uh, so, the notion of sociality occurs both in the defin both in the definition and in the uh, con conditions or boundary conditions of the definition. So, I have a modest proposal. I wonder. I think it's going to actually change the concept a bit, but I wonder what you think of it. Take the word social out of the second occurrence. So it reads, individuals belong to a common sociocultural group and formed by a common environment. With environment obviously to be defined more broadly than social mores, ties, values, and so on. Yeah. Would you? Uh, I would. I, 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 such a, I, would, I would. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the you know one of the inspirations for this view was was actually reading the German philosopher. Herder, the 18th century 
philosopher, and when he's talking about this common environment, actually, like many other 18th century thinkers, he uses the word climate. Now, it's obviously going to be more than just climate, and in fact, I, I think he meant climate in a much broader sense than we use the uh, term, but he, 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 I think he meant to denote um, a kind of whole range of um, kind of features of an environment that are relevant to um, the, the socialization of, of human beings. Um, so the fact that you know the fact that a group of people um, you know live in the shadows of a mountain range and kind of share in orienting their lives to the mountain range, or, or, or live on a live along the sea and uh, live a maritime existence. These are um, uh, the sort of things I think he had in mind, and I think they kind of survive into this proposal, and I think are consistent with your um, your reform reformulation. I would just add, parenthetically, he's yeah. going to uh, fix the definition of social groups and make it much, not essential, but make it much more limited. Right? Some groups will qualify, others won't, by criteria of the physical and social environment that they're in. So, for instance, some of the examples you gave mm -hmm. may not qualify as social groups on that, once you change the definition that way. Scotland, for instance, it's not clear. It's a different environment. You can make a case, but it's not a clear case. I think Scotland is a, is a board, I agree that Scotland is a board one case. There isn't, uh, and in fact, many point to Scotland as an example of, as an example meant to bolster the thought that being a national group is really just a matter of self-identification, and that there's no, if you like, deeper cultural, uh, cultural dimension. Um, yeah, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say there's nothing. Uh, there is a kind of history of separate administrative and especially school, school institutions there. Uh, there's different religious um, um, institutions. And then, of course, there's territorial um, isolation from the rest of, rest of Britain. But there, there isn't a linguistic difference, which I think is often you know, the, the main driver of the sort of socializing isolation. I have a question about um, the value of self determination. So, you're suggesting that it's a good thing if you know, people are able to express their culture and have a fit between their national culture and their self determination. It strikes me as only important if uh, you already think self determination has to be tied to the nation. You know, if you take uh, acceptance of self determination, that status, for instance, think, well, look, like, National culture just should just should not fit into um, uh, a state's self-determining institutions, policies, etc. Then there's no reason why a group that has a particular culture would feel excluded for a very reason. Why they would feel like they would need to have a kind of autonomy arrangement that's formalized differently, and right? maybe just minority right protections, fish or something like this. So I'm not sure like why the value of national self-determination is so important there. Instrumental, basically, if you don't already take it as the thought. Would, the thought is um, so. Suppose you have. A, I, I think you're granting, in for, in for the purpose of the question, that you you have a, a group that we can think of as being a, dis, a distinctive national, substate national group. Um, and then, then the question. So at least I'm granting. Once I get to the part of the section on value, I'm granting that there is, there is such a group. Um, let's say it's the Scots, or let's say it's uh, the say it's indigenous a group, group in, right. in the United States, right? So um, regardless of whether you grant there are such groups, yeah. you might just say, why bother having these groups be able to express themselves right. through form or through some institution? Yeah. You can have, obviously we have justice through a state, and then you just don't really value expression of certain nations in that state. Right. And so why care then? Um, about these particular groups, and we don't already care about them. Sort of, we don't care about national um, expression uh, politically. That's just sort of not important. Yeah. If we, if we don't care about it as being important to begin with, then we don't need to have autonomy arrangements for particular nations. Yeah. Um, 
Well, so the, the thought is that, uh, so if you, suppose you do have such a group, uh, and it has, that, that there's a sort of distinctive uh, set of preferences and values, distinctive pattern that corresponds with that group. Think again, of, you know, indigenous people, or, I mean, this was often argued again by the Scots in the 1990s, that the rest of the country is much more thatch right, has much more thatch right political values, whereas the, the sort of, the dominant values and preferences in Scotland were, um, were more collectivist, different, different in certain, different in certain respects. If all the, if all decisions are made on a statewide basis, then those minority um, preferences and traditions and values are presumably going to be quite frequently outvoted by everybody else in. Uh, Everybody else in the society. So that's the basic instrumental, instrumental argument. Whereas if you create a, um, if you if you create an internal autonomy arrangement, then the minority can, to some extent, make public policies that fit with their uh, distinctive beliefs and traditions. Whereas and the majority can continue to make policies that fit uh, fit, uh, fit with theirs. So. Um, so it, it, and you, one, one last thought is that you said, well, the, the, what, what if the majority doesn't really care about this? Uh, it's often the case the majority thinks they don't care about it because they can they kind of automatically get a, um, a, dem, a, a kind of a democratic forum in which their views of political community and their preferences about how certain institutions ought to be structured. Are, are kind of naturally in the, the majority, and so the kind of question of, of whether they value their nationhood just doesn't really occur to them. It's, it's, it's not surprising, it's kind of almost a prediction of the view that, that this sense of distinctive nationality would be especially prevalent amongst, amongst uh, minority. Jesse? So I have a question about Turchin to ontology. So I guess I have a question about the granularity of these groups that you have in mind. Um, of the nations. So yeah. specifically, as I understand your nation, your new nations, you think that there's some homogenous social environment that produces some sort of statistically homogenous group of people who share certain beliefs, etc., values. Um, but I guess it seems to me that you could sort of, if you consider any given social environment, you could then take some subset of that social environment uh, that would probably be even more homogenous, right? It seems like the smaller you get, the more homogeneity you're going to get in terms of social context, like whether you know, it's like you start with a big region, you go to yeah. a state, you go to a small district, you yeah. go, you know, yeah. even down to a household. Right. And it seems like also at the same time you're going to get an increasing homogeneity in terms of the values, beliefs, and identification of the people in mm -hmm. those groups. Yeah. So then I wonder, you know, it seems like in some sense that homogeneity is important, right? Like that seems to, I don't know exactly to what extent it grounds the value of self-determination, but it seems like the more homogeneity in sense, the more important, my intuition is at least, is the more important it becomes for you to have sort of self-determination. So I guess I just wonder, do you think this leads to some sort of race to the bottom where you end up with almost like, you know, nations being these extremely fine, right, you know, people who grew up in my house or yeah. like on my block, right. right? And that in fact not only being a relevant, you know, unit, but in fact being the most important unit in terms of questions of self-determination. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's an excellent question. I, yeah, it's actually an issue that I try to grapple with in the recognition both in the, in the, the corresponding uh, um, paper. Um, yeah, I don't think, I'm not sure, I, I, would, I don't think of these um, social environments as being I wouldn't use the word homogenous to describe them, but but you're, but you're right in the sense that the thought is that there's a kind of a common treatment that's being applied to a group of people, and it's in, it's it's because you've all received that treatment that we consider you to be a group. I mean that's the that's the basic um, that's the basic um, thought. Um, so one thing I think to say is that I think it's it's part of the phenomenon that we're trying to describe and theorize here. That um, that uh, kind of culture and groupness is is nested, right? So you can think of your uh, you can think of yourself as being um, I don't know a, you know part of the from raised in the part of Western world, American, Eastern American, you know from New Jersey, from Central Central Jersey, from you know Princeton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And these are all kind of meaningful ways I think of. You know, lo locating yourself and also pointing to 
certain aspects of your social experience that help to explain who you are now and that all and differentiate differentiate you from um, other other people. So, I mean, so you're so part of what you're suggesting might be a kind of almost a reductio. It's to some extent, I think, a vir virtue of the virtue of the. Um, of the account. Of course, we wouldn't call all those nations, but I, I, I was trying to argue that na nations involves these additional uh, characteristics. So I just yeah. want to follow on yeah. myself, because first I was going to ask you about New York City, uh, for example. Sure. There are large metropolitan areas. Uh, you know, why, uh, would we, why wouldn't your characterization simply apply to us? In fact, maybe we should succeed given the way the U.S. is. But um, and that was one question, but in response to what you just said, it would be convenient if it was all nested and of course normatively we could make proposals for subsidiarity or everything mm -hmm. would be organized. But in fact, you, you know, you have quite a number of these national minorities that are spread out across different states. Right. And that do not form nested groups within some larger whole. Yeah. And some of the most contentious ones um, are in fact spread out. Right. So what do you do about those cases where they feel themselves, a lot of what you said, I mean, the history, the lineage may have had a similar formation, but you know, Germans and Poland. Yeah. Or now, with more transformation over time, you've got them in different states. Well, this goes back to why I, why I prefer what I call a sort of moderate uh, version of the nationalist view um, over one that says every nation its own state or every group its own um, uh, political political um, entity. Partly there's the sort of instability <laughs> worry that Robert Lansing mm -hmm. emphasizes. But I actually think there's also an egalitarian um, egalitarian worry. So that, as, as you say, I think the, the, the normal situation is that members of a, of a, a national minority are um, living side by side with members of the national national majority, it's happened in Scotland and Quebec, they may be cross border. Um, and well, there, 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 there may be a there's a border, but on both sides of the border, it, it, it's quite typical that there are both groups, right, that are that are represented. And there's no way that you would perfectly draw the border in order to, in, to kind of feasibly separate. Uh, everybody out, and that's why. I, so that's why I think that um, this idea of a fair distribution of self determination is something, something that just sort of scratched the surface of in my remarks. But um, that privileges um, a, a a system that involves internal autonomy over both a unitary state on the one hand and um, secession for minorities on the other hand. Because both the unitary state and secession, I think, undermine uh, the sort of equality that, you, that, that arises when you have internal autonomy. When you have internal autonomy, then you, then you have a situation that's more like the neighbors in Scotland that I, the fictional neighbors that I described, in which you could be living in the same apartment building as, as somebody who has a completely different national identity, and yet you can both point to a democratic forum that applies to your community that corresponds to the sense of political community with which you are um, with which you are attached. And so I think there's something kind of um, that, that equality kind of privileges a certain way of thinking about these uh, issues. Josh? Okay, I think my question kind of goes back to the first question a little bit back when we're conceptualizing Oops. national minorities. Yes. Um, so I guess what I'm wondering is, you end up having this common environment forming a social group, and then there's all these things that fall out of that. They have sort of the same beliefs. They have the multidimensional support of their identity. And it seems like then all of those sorts of values are what then underwrite the value of this nationality, right? And so I'm wondering why not, I mean, one, why give this sort of like causal theory of it, it matters how they perform? Um, and then, but my thought here is something like, you know, you say this about the internet, like it allows you to find, you know, go find your community, right? Like, you may not have been formed in the same place or by the same forces, but you can go find the people who are like you and you can make a community with them now. So easily, this is maybe something good about the internet, maybe 
make something bad. Um, but if you can do that, wouldn't that community, just by virtue of having sort of sharing these normative features that we want to value, this identification, this multidimensionality, this you know shared beliefs and values, wouldn't it then qualify for all the same rights despite not having been formed the same way? And doesn't that suggest that it's really like there's sort of a more direct route to what you want to get at later in the paper that's just about this idea of sort of there are going to be groups, there are going to be social groups, they're going to share these features which sort of make them morally important as groups. And we might, wherever we find such groups and however we find them, want to give them some sort of institutional recognition and systems of government. Yeah. Um, give them some sort of limited autonomy to the extent that we can. And it's not going to matter whether or not they're a national group or a professional group or, you know, I mean, there may be all these different ways that yeah. we want to layer and sort of, you know, vertically and horizontally yeah. our sovereignty in response to just the type of considerations. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm too big to that. So, so I mean, I, I think of the under, so when I get to the justice section, I think of the, um, the sort of underlying values of an individualist value, which says that each person, each individual, ought to have a fair opportunity to realize their conception of the, the good, their preferences, their attachments, their, their identity, etc. And that underlying principle is going to have all sorts of different ramifications, I think, for political, for political philosophy. Um, it, it, one of the, some of the ramifications are going to be, uh, I feel like, ramifications for how we think about um, the world of civil society, how we think about issues of freedom of association, how we think about issues of state neutrality towards different groups and different values and preferences in uh, in society, and um, there, I think there are going to be meaningful consequences for how we think about, about those, and, and I think those will um, um, connect with the sorts of examples that you um, that you mentioned. I think what's what's special about, to some extent, about the concerns of um, that, that are rising connection with nationalism and claims of national. Um, National minorities is um, that these. I think these are claims that can't be adequately dealt with as if they were just um, uh, demands um, uh, that are like the demands of a group in in, in civil society for freedom of association or for uh, for neutrality. Because the because because a nationalist demand is a demand about how. The state itself, the, the the entity which is going to make those decisions about how civil society is is organized, how, how the state itself is 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 itself structured, what its what its boundaries are, what its kind of internal institutional structure um, look like. So there's um, I think there's a there's a sort of discontinuity there, and we need to think about that issue. Somewhat separately, but I would nonetheless insist. I think, and this is where I come back to my fundamental agreement with you, that there's a kind of common, basic principle of the, this idea of fair opportunity for what I call fair opportunity for self determination that should guide our thinking about both. No. Oh, oh, thank you. <laughs> One of the things that really caught my attention, you said, if a multinational state does a good job of carving out the space for national minority. The international community should, you know, value its ter protect its territorial integrity, guarantee yes. its territorial integrity. But can you maybe speak a bit more? What instruments would be used to measure whether they've done that job or not? So, if I'm sitting in the UN Security Council, where do I look into what 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 document, what convention, uh, or set of principles can I, you know, use as a measuring stick to see whether the state has given? appropriate set of autonomy, for example, in Western Sahara or in Somaliland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't have a well worked out answer to that question, but I recognize that it, that it is the next, it's the next question I'm going to have to uh, um, address. Um, but I mean, the, the, the underlying, the underlying principle is, um, is there a meaningful uh, thinking, thinking in the context of a democracy, is there a meaningful democratic um, 
forum that corresponds to um, a uh, kind of a widely shared sense of political community or sense of national um, identity. Um, now, what? So the question is, what counts as meaningful, and um, um, how ro how robust does that forum have to be? And I think that's that's a lot a lot of time where these debates really really focus on. So, for instance, in the Spanish case, which I think I re referred to, um, you know, a, a lot. I think a lot of what has um, um, fueled recent secessionist. Um, movements in Cat Catalonia was um, the idea that the, the, the central court of Spain would have the authority just to kind of annul certain autonomy guarantees that apparently to, to, to Catalonia. So we want to look for meaningful autonomy arrangements, and we'd also want to look that they be not just kind of, you know, uh, gra granted um, Kind of as a as a favor, but that they be kind of institutionalized in a more uh, in a more robust robust way. So yeah, I, I I wish I could answer your question better. I mean, I, I I'm still thinking at the sort of level of what the normative principle is, but I, I agree that um, you know lawyers would want to go far, farther and try to flat, flesh out in more concrete terms what um, what the what, what specific criteria. Thanks. Um, so I, I had also a question about institutions. Um, okay. So one of the concerns that I have about the kinds of arrangements you have in mind, federalism, various forms of devolution, um, is that they introduce uh, what I think is often a very pernicious form of complexity into these systems, which in particular I think is in tension with the democratic uh, form of nationalism. Why? Because complexity dissolves responsibility and makes it very unclear who to blame or who to hold responsible for particular kinds of governing outcomes. So let me give you an example from right now that's still going on. Uh, Brexit, right? This was a national referendum. Um, and it's my understanding that right now there's some consideration that maybe the devolved um, parliaments in Scotland and Northern Ireland have to sign on to Brexit separately in order for that to, to go forward constitutionally. Now, say what you will about the merits of Brexit. It clearly has democratic legitimacy. I right? may think it's a terrible decision. It was clearly a fairly run referendum. If that devolved authority leads to the foiling of Brexit, who, where does democracy in that? Where is democratic legitimacy? Who has gotten their way in, 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 this, in this arrangement? It seems like this is a big problem for democracy, but Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I, the specific example of Brexit is, com is, um, is complex because in a sense it's a, you can think of it as a kind of active self, an attempted active self-determination. Self but, but I think the problem that you're describing arises even in more prosaic uh, cases in which, you know, something goes wrong in, one state and citizens complain about this. One state, say the United States, and they go to their state, they go to their governor and their state legislature and say, "This is how you guys let this happen." And then they say, "No, of course this is all because of this federal federal government policy, or maybe it's a municipal uh, a municipal." Uh, and so when, once you have multi-level governance, I think there's always going to be some degree of buck. Of passing right, of the sort, um, I agree that's a cost, um, and but, but so what I'm trying to do in a, in a way is kind of articulate the the value of the structure that gives rise to costs of this kind. Um, but the argument I'm making is is a it's a pro tanto argument. Uh, I think it's a fairly weighty pro tanto argument, but it's a pro tanto argument. Uh, and we'll then have to, um, at the end of the day, to decide whether it's a good all things considered argument. We're obviously going to have to factor in um, the, the costs on the other hand. But I, but I agree, we wouldn't want to kind of 
proliferate in an uncontrolled way different levels of governance because there would just be endless buck passing and it would never be clear who, who to boot out, right, when, when you were governed in the back. Sally, did you want to jump in? Um, I mean, I'm not really unhappy with the question. I just think that that formulation of the question is extremely unhelpful because I don't think very many people think that Brexit was a fair, legitimate, democratic result in a straightforward way because the referendum was run so badly and because who leaves a decision that big down to you know, one referendum which had a 50% threshold. So like, I just found the formulation of that very unfortunate because I, can, because I don't think many people Promises of the case that you put forward, but I, I agree that like, it's a question that maybe deserves to be raised. Just it doesn't work in that formulation. I should say I'm sort of sympathetic with that in the sense that I, you know, didn't get into this today, but this is related to um, my views on secession. I mean, Brexit is a kind of secession, right? Um, which are quite anti-plebiscitary. So I, I, I think that I think it's deeply problematic just to have a have a plebiscite and say. 50% plus one automatically entails a kind of legitimate, uh, con uh, confers legitimacy. There's several more questions, Jeff, first. Uh, we sort of started to talk about it a little bit, and I think maybe it sounds like there's more work to be done to develop it, but I'm just wondering if there's like a principle or a set of principles that distinguish the kind of authority a state might have versus that of uh, like internally autonomous nations. Um, is there, what, what kinds of power or kind of distinguish that? There's a good in principle. I mean, I, I think that uh, obviously um, the, the state is going to have to include certain institutions that govern the relationships in, between the different re regions and, and parts. Um, you would think that it would normally be in the interests of the regions or parts to concentrate the power to uh, relate to other countries in central in a uh, central state. So I mean, that, that would be sort of the, the minimum in thinking about, but I'm not sure there's something that one can say at the level of principle beyond. A couple of questions, yes. Um, so just as an aside, I thought when you were talking about the different social groups, I immediately thought of the LGBT movement, just because like we have our own flag would be interesting to like, conceive of, you know, there's definitely individuation and the socialization. But uh, leading into my question, how do, could you just speak more about the boundaries condition as to, like, does there need to be, you know, contiguity? Does there need to be, um, as you said, this, uh, uh, the, the lineage of where they're holding the territory? So, for instance, in Wisconsin, the Ho-Chunk tribe don't actually occupy any of their historical territory. If you look at a map, it's just a bunch of dots because when they purchased land to put, uh, uh, to, to legalize gambling on, they apply for it to be considered tribal land, but then it's just like a bunch of dots, and it would seem problematic to say that they have some boundary condition that. So it's going to be really like yeah. that. Um, I mean, I, I do think that territoriality is important. Um, for distinguishing um, the response to appropriate response to national groups from what we would think of as the appropriate response to other kinds of groups in civil civil society, either the rights of LGBT or you know rights of professional groups or the rights of um, people who have particular you know, leisure activities. Um, that, that, there's, that, that what, what, in, what the national groups are interested in is how, um, how the state is kind of organized and structured and um, how, um, perhaps how it, um, it relates to different, to the operation of the law on different bits of, different bits of territory. So some, I think some groups, the nature of their demands um, doesn't kind of in, involve the idea of a legal regime over some stretch of stretch of territory, and so I think those demands would be I think properly dealt with in the way that we think about kind of other claims in, in, in civil society. Right. 
right, that's just the beginning of it. Okay, two more. Here we go. You talked about a social lineage, and most of the examples that you've given are clear cases of minorities, such as the Scots or the Quebecois or uh, the Catalonians. Uh, those groups predate the nation in which they reside. Yeah. And but in some of the discussion that we've had, predate the state in which they reside, yeah. right? They, yeah. they predate the nation. The, the, the Catalonians were there before Spain. Right? Right. So Quebecois are remnants of the French occupation before right. the, yeah. uh, the, the English took over. So, but in some of the questions here, like should New York secede? You know, is this idea of there, there is no social history that predates the state. So. Are new minorities capable of being formed now, absence the movement of a border or a social revolution? Can they suck up the LGBT? I mean, uh, uh, can they spontaneously generate? How about the Somali community that's developing in Iowa, around Iowa City? There's a lot of immigrants that are concentrating that. Yeah. Uh, is that kind of uh, immigration that we have a concentration of a new group? Does that form a new minority? Even because it is, even though it is self-imposed, right, or self-chosen, yeah. really, uh, or they all kind of has to have this historical origin, yeah. the social lineage. So. I mean, I think the social lineage is important um, for kind of, um, making them the kind of group that would have a way, would have a way. Um, but I wouldn't want to, I certainly want to rule out the possibility that new groups could come into existence which, you know, didn't, didn't stretch back for centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. I partly had that in mind when I mentioned the example of Hong Kong, right, right. Um, yeah, which is, really which is a really interesting, I think a really interesting case and it's, it's, it's almost like an emergent, um, you know, an emergent national consciousness there, which is a response to authoritarianism in China and the experience of distinctive experience of British uh, colonialism and the existence of autonomy arrangements. And so it wasn't it wasn't like the, there was anything that was there much in the past. Right. But something new is emerging, which seems to at least have some of the still features. results from a national border moving, if you would say, right? The, the, the yeah. Yeah. The thing with China proper, um, right. not violence, so right. the national research, uh, the more about whether we can self-generate these things. So maybe it's a separate class, you know, of, of minority. Right. So. Emily, you ask a question. Oh, thanks. Um, I have a question about the justice bit. So you formulated the question as, um, is there a claim that are defensible um, justice value that like defends the view and then you go for a equal distribution or some sort of fairness but it seems to me that there are, are other questions that follow from that that relate to justice like so, sort of relating to urgency right there might be some context like settler colonial context or former colonies where the urgency of the claim might be more uh, justifiable or more pressing um, but you talked about proportionality as like mitigating and an international relationship? Is there a way to like pose these questions about urgency under the subheading of justice, or does the account deal with that in any way? Um, I didn't quite catch the last the last part. So. I just wasn't sure whether proportionality, because you talk. I mean, so it was so briefly. We yeah. didn't really have time to flush that out. But would that be where you're thinking these kinds of questions could be posed, or is that another issue altogether? No, I, I, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think. I guess. I guess what I had in mind there was somebody might resist the claim that there was a um, uh, a map, that there was a, an issue of justice that related to um, self determination. And so then I would say the thing I said about about distribution, and then and then the response to that might be say, okay, fine, but there isn't um, an issue of of uh, justice that um, concerns that of international concern. That that sounds like okay. the sort of the sort of claim of justice that's 
appropriately kind of internal to the, the domestic politics of some, of some state. And then I guess my response to that would be to say, well, actually I think that almost anything that's an issue of justice could conceivably be a matter of international concern. But we have to take very seriously this idea of um, proportionality and the fact that something might be of international concern. Um, I mean, it could just be that that could just correspond to a mere declaration in some international document, which is then useful for domestic actors as a kind of coordinating point, or it could mean something a little bit more or something a little bit more than that, etc. But once you take proportionality seriously, then I think there's going to be you like a ceiling on the sorts of uh, actions that international actors can take to try to promote justice. Promote justice. So, yeah, it kind of comes in a sort of complicated. Uh, okay, well, we should continue this um, with uh, some New York cuisine and not New York one. Down on the fifth floor in the Ralph Winters. Please join me in thanking Professor.